Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Michelle Jansen, who is a professor in the program in the History of Science, Technology and Medicine and School of Physics and Astronomy uh, in the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Sure. Yeah. So you have a very unique uh, background. You teach both the history of physics, uh, as well as um, some uh, fairly uh, high level courses in physics, including quantum mechanics. Uh, I want to start, um, you know, kind of get a big picture view of the history of quantum mechanics, uh, which is a field that has been around for a while. And I was just reading about it a little bit today. And I realized that uh, the double slit experiment uh, was in 1801. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is sort of, you know, one could argue that is sort of the start of the problem, so to yeah. speak, right? Uh, you want to you want to uh, give a sort of a sketch of the history of how, how it evolved over time? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I should first say that, um, so it, it is a bit unusual for like a historian of science to be in a physics department. Um, that's like a, what is known as the Minnesota model. And... Yeah. Uh, so I mainly, I really only teach like history of science classes, but I do a lot of guest lecturing for my colleagues in physics. So that's what I, where I talk about, talk to students in quantum mechanics or in relativity about this kind of stuff. So now on the history of, um, the history of quantum mechanics, I'm actually working on a, um, uh, on a book, a uh, two volume book on uh, the genesis of quantum mechanics together with a particle physicist at the University of Pittsburgh named uh, Tony Duncan. Um, yeah. And uh, so our story, I mean, doesn't really begin with the, um, uh, with the, with the double slit experiment. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain later, like, why I, I, don't, I don't like that as a starting point. It really starts, <laughs> okay. it really starts with, uh, um, with uh, attempts to come to terms with something called black body radiation, which is a particular kind yeah. of heat radiation. And uh, so it's in that context that uh, around 1900, uh, like Planck, you know, to come up with a law for um, uh, for black body radiation is is going to have to introduce uh, this 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 idea uh, that uh, the uh, the energy of uh, of resonators like like uh, uh, interacting with this radiation that the mm -hmm. that the energy of these uh, of these resonators is quantized that it can only take on like certain discrete values and there's a big debate among historians. How seriously he uh, he took that uh, quantization, but let's leave that aside for the moment. The point I want to make. So that realize. So just a quick yeah. question. So that that realization uh, did that happen experimentally, or it was sort of theoretical? It was. Insight? So so people were. Um, so basically, the idea the idea is so you have this heat radiation, and yeah. in the uh, you know by the by the middle of the of the nineteenth century, uh, physicists had figured out. Uh, this is like people like Kirchhoff on the base of thermodynamics, that, that the spectral distribution of that radiation uh, should, should always be the same. So, so by spectral distribution, I simply mean like 
how much energy output do you have at all these different frequencies? And so the challenge now was to come up with an explicit formula to give like this spectral distribution. And this is what Planck supplied. And, uh, but in order to get the formula to, um, uh, in order to get the, 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 to be able to derive the formula, which he had initially just kind of guessed, uh, in order to derive the formula, he, uh, he discovered that he had to assume sort of this strange behavior of the energy of like resonators, like you, that you can think of as little charges on springs interacting with this radiation. Mm. And mm. so, uh, and, and Planck was very reluctant to give too much sort of physical meaning to this. He thought in the end, this was kind of a mathematical trick. Uh, others uh, like uh, in particular, like uh, Albert Einstein and Paul Ehrenfest we're taking this more seriously. And uh, so Einstein is then is really the, uh, the in my view, uh, the person who, uh, you know, sort of put this whole uh, quantum idea on the map in 1905, where he went as far as saying, like, even the radiation itself is, uh, is quantized and comes in little packages like that he called light quantum that are now called photons. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, so we, we don't typically uh, think about Einstein as uh, sort of the, the early... Um, uh, early physicists in the quantum physics area. And uh, this equation, that Planck's equation, is, is, um, is on the surface very simple, E equal to HV, mm -hmm. where H is the Planck's constant and V is the frequency mu, right, of the radiation, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, uh, mu, mu, okay, before H, H mu. mu. Yeah. Oh, mu, mu. okay, the, yeah. The, yeah, the Greek letter, yeah. So, so that Planck's constant, uh, and so it, it, it's a very elegant, very elegant idea, Mm -hmm. And and so so you were saying this uh, this appeal to Albert Albert Einstein and he he developed some of these ideas forward. Yeah, like um, um, so. I mean, what what Einstein uh, Einstein realized um, is that um, is 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 that if you if you don't if you don't introduce this quantization idea, that classical theory really. Uh, like leads to problems and cannot account for this phenomenon of black body radiation. So this is something that is very famous, like that Ehrenfest called the ultraviolet catastrophe that, uh, you know, like the, the energy instead of, you know, like having a nice distribution of the energy over all the frequencies, like if you go to larger frequencies, the energy just goes up, 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 like to infinity. So what I want to say is that so, so Einstein... Um, so saw like okay you you can get this uh, you, you the, the way to think about like uh, uh, radiation is in terms of these little packages right and so the energy of like a photon is that same equation you mentioned e equals h nu and then like uh, two years later so, th so this was not a popular idea people like a lot of people resisted this uh, Planck included and uh, so two years later like he came up with the idea like okay you know um, we can I can use that same sort of quantization idea to tackle like a, an, another problem uh, that people had run into in the, in the 19th century, not black like body radiation, but the specific heats of solids at low temperatures. So the, the expectation was that, you know, the, the specific heat is just the same at all temperatures, right? So the specific heat is like, how much heat do you have to uh, add to a particular substance to like make it rise in temperature by one degree? And that, you know, depends on what kind of substance you're talking about. Um, so, so, that, so, is it correct to to think about this, um, think about this, Michelle, as sort of a transition from the analog way of thinking about it to a digital way of thinking about it, or that is not uh, for this or for this early right. phase? Uh, yeah, you can certainly think about it that way, right? So, but, uh, but, yeah. but in a way, like, um, so, so this, this gets to the question, like, you know, what is what is distinctive about quantum mechanics as opposed to classical mechanics? And the initial, the initial idea you may have, and which the, the name quantum mechanics suggests, is that, well, classically, everything is like uh, continuous and like in quantum mechanics, everything is discrete. That turns out not yeah. to be the case. But like early on, that definitely seemed to be sort of the, the hallmark of, uh, of quantum theory and hence the, uh, the name. So Einstein, Einstein now had these two uh, different uh, applications for these quantum ideas, and those ideas are really typical of the early, uh, early development. And so, uh, people often ask me, like, you know, when did quantum mechanics get started? And so, physicists like to say, well, it was with Planck in 1900. Well, but I'm, I'm, I'm 
thinking like, well, but Planck wasn't taking these ideas too seriously. Well, what about Einstein in 1905? Okay, well, he was taking it seriously, but very few others were. I think a better starting point is the first big conference devoted to quantum mechanics, which was in Brussels, the first Solvay conference in 1911. Yeah. And there, like, there's a famous picture of all the physicists that, that, uh, that were invited. Um, and in the background, you see like a blackboard with Planck's formula for black body radiation. And then you see like a little uh, a sheet of paper with some graphs for uh, for the specific heats of solids. And those really were the two topics. And both in both mm. cases, what you're talking about is really a form of statistical mechanics where you look at the collective behavior of large amounts of very simple systems, like, you know, called harmonic oscillators. Now, the big uh, game changer in the history of quantum mechanics comes in 1913 with the Bohr model. Yeah. So now all of a sudden, like right. I mean, I think I think your listeners, like you know, we've all seen this in high school, right? You like you think of atoms as like little little solar systems where the electrons yeah. go around the nucleus like planets around the sun, with the difference that only certain uh, orbits are allowed. And and that was really right. a game changer because now all of a sudden quantum is not anymore is no longer about the collective behavior of these very simple systems but trying to model individual and sometimes quite complicated mm. uh, systems like atoms with like you know uh, one or more electrons atoms put like in a combination of electric and magnetic fields and people are now mm. trying to as, account for a wealth of data coming out of spectroscopy because they knew that, okay, you know, these atoms and these molecules, they all have very characteristic spectra, but there was absolutely no, people had no idea how to account for any of this. So what Bohr, like, uh, supplied was, well, at least we now have a prayer to come up with a theory for the structure of these atoms that can explain, like, why we see the light uh, given off by the atoms having the frequencies they have. So this right. Yeah, and so so th this was sort of a necessary condition because electrons could only occupy certain energy levels, right? So they they just couldn't have gotten this model without without that idea. Yeah, um, so so th right. so th this basic idea of the the uh, you know the, the this energy is quantized that really fed into uh, Bohr's thinking, uh, but yeah. like what 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 Planck and Einstein uh, uh, had not considered was to to now really think about like models of atoms and this really came so this there's experiments done by rutherford so bohr of course was uh, danish but he, he did this work while he was in manchester as a postdoc with rutherford and rutherford did, did these experiments like showing that uh, you know the structure of an atom is like a, a, it's a nuclear structure there's something most of the mass is in the center and then you have electrons whirling around it and bohr what bohr did was yeah. make a more precise model of that basic idea and for about 10 years, people started, you know, kept working at this. Uh, Bohr, and in particular, like his colleague in Munich, Arnold Sommerfeld, uh, and two of Sommerfeld's students uh, uh, that became who became household names, Wolfgang Pauli and Werner Heisenberg, um, trying to like work out these ideas. And by the early 20s, uh, this ran, they had some success early on, but by the early 20s, it was yeah. mainly misery. Uh, they could not. They they these, they could they could like come up with like all kinds of empirical rules for like spectra under like all sorts of conditions, magnetic fields, electric fields, Zeeman effect, Stark effect. But they could not come up with like consistent mechanical models that would explain these rules. Yeah. And so then like there was this move like in the mid twenties. Yeah. So so during that time, uh, nineteen ten through nineteen twenty. Uh, Einstein's uh, theories are developing simultaneously, right? Uh, obviously, uh, a different uh, different field altogether. But yeah, but that's so, yeah, so, so Einstein, Einstein so, like yeah. so Einstein did very important work early on on quantum, like on on black body radiation, on specific heats, till about like 1911, and then like he got you know he got frustrated by quantum theory and spent the next six years or so working on gravity, right? And so, like, he produces his general theory of, of relativity. And after that, after that's done, like, in 1916, 1917, he returns to quantum theory. But now Bohr has arrived on the scene. And it's actually Einstein who sort of uh, picks up on some of these ideas of Bohr 
and so the, what we mm. teach our, our uh, students in high school is really a mix of Einstein's ideas and Bohr's ideas. So Bohr, for instance, hated the idea that, uh, you know, when an electron jumps from like one orbit to another uh, orbit, that a photon is being sent out. He thought a classical wave was mm. being sent out. No, said Einstein, it's a photon. Mm. And that idea was not accepted until the early twenties. So what you get, what you, but what you get then in the in the in the twenties is that uh, people like Heisenberg and Pauli, just to mention the most famous names, uh, there's, uh, yeah. you know, with help from you know like uh, people in 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 Göttingen, a center for mathematics, with Max Born, his student Pascal Jordan, they developed this this very abstract kind of mechanics that becomes known as matrix mechanics, where you just completely give up the idea that there are these well-defined orbits. Okay, so that's one path to uh, that's is in fact sort of the main path to quantum mechanics. Now, the the ideas I was talking about earlier about you know the collective behavior of very simple systems and a kind of statistical mechanics that doesn't die. Um, that uh, that is picked up in, again in the early twenties by uh, other like big names like Louis de Broglie in uh, in in Paris. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Bose, like in uh, in, uh, in, in in Daga now Daga now right now, and, mm. and so so Indian physicist Einstein himself, and in the yeah. end Schrödinger, and that then leads to like a completely different uh, uh, form of uh, quantum theory known as wave mechanics, right? So in uh, mm. so uh, in the in uh, in you know twenty three twenty four like there is this period of well, there's nothing that uh, that can account for what we're seeing here. And then by 26, you all of a sudden you have like sort of an embarrassment of riches that there is like at least two different theories uh, that uh, that look completely different that can account for the phenomenon. And there's the rock. So that is uh, so that is uh, so matrix mechanics and yes. wave mechanics. So there's sort of, these are yes. the two kind of dueling. Theories Correct. to sort of explain and quantum. so okay. uh, yeah. and okay. and so now and and like there is a variation on matrix mechanics due to the uh, uh, British physicist Paul de Rock called Q number theory, uh, and so like all of a sudden like in tw by twenty six there is these different uh, theories floating around and people are trying to sort of make sense of like how they relate to each other. So Schrödinger and Pauli realize early on that although these theories look completely different, they always lead to the same prediction. Mm. And so uh, then Max Born realizes, well, these theories are also statistical theories, that which is sort of a novelty, right? In, uh, in physics, it's about it's about probabilities. <laughs> and then, like in very short yeah. order, in late twenty six, early twenty seven, Dirac and Jordan, two of the pioneers of these fields. I, I should also mention the people that I'm mentioning here are incredibly young. You know, like they're born around nineteen hundred. Mm. If you look at the picture that at that Solvay conference in nineteen eleven. None of them are there. No Dirac, no Heisenberg, no Pauli, because all these guys, they're 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 teenagers. Like at that point, the next, the, the fifth <laughs> Solvay conference, the famous one in 1927. There you see, like you know, Heisenberg and Pauli, and there you know the the champs of 1911, like Planck and Einstein, actually already look quite old. So 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 things look, but things <laughs> are moving very fast. And so Dirac and Jordan in 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 uh, uh, late 26, early 27. Come up with a with a with a formalism that unifies these two theories. This is called like a statistical transformation theory. And then, like shortly thereafter, uh, the um, Hungarian, later American mathematician John von Neumann, reading some of uh, 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 Jordan's papers, he thinks like, my goodness, I mean, these guys don't know like some mathematics that mathematicians have known about for twenty years. And I can actually do this, <laughs> this, this unification of these two theories in a much more elegant fashion using some of these mathematical ideas mm. that he then calls like Hilbert space, right? So this is the, yeah. now for, for me, was for, for me on the scene also uh, during that time. Uh, uh, Fermi is like uh, he comes a little bit a, a little bit later. Uh, so um, okay. uh, so I would I would say Fermi is more uh, you know the the further development of the of the theory. So. Uh, you know, like you, of course, we, if you hear like Fermi, you think like fermions and bosons and bosons, of course, right. uh, named after Bose. And the, and, and what this is, is like, you know, Bose-Einstein statistics. Uh, it's again, it's about like um, how to do the statistical mechanics of large collections of simple systems. And so Fermi, and so opposed to Bose-Einstein statistics, you have Fermi-Dirac statistics. 
uh, where you can do some like similar things for now particles with with spin you know like so this is another uh, element that comes out of left field uh, in the early uh, 20s like the discovery of um, uh, of electron spin so this is I'm, I'm originally from the netherlands as you can probably tell from my accent yeah um, and so it I, I can with great authority pronounce the names of the two people in, who introduced that that's uh, uh Smith, <laughs> yeah. Smith and Ullenbeck. yeah uh, and so so and uh. and so and uh, but in order to uh, to really uh, do that properly you need to further develop quantum mechanics into like something called relativistic quantum mechanics which will will become what we now call quantum field theory and it's 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 more in that context yeah. that i think that people like fermi uh, become uh, become important like the the the, the heroes of like the uh, so sort of the early uh, the early uh, establishment of non relativistic quantum mechanics are the people i mentioned right so right. on the matrix mechanics side you have, you know heisenberg born born bohr pauli jordan and on the wave mechanics side you have de broglie uh, einstein and, uh, uh, and 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 schrodinger and bose so, so during this time, there, there are some sort of not a conflict but disagreements, right, between uh, Einstein and the and the proponents of quantum um, mechanics. Well, the, that again comes a little bit uh, a little bit later, right? So the, the, later. the big conflict at this point okay. uh, is the conflict between the people in the matrix mechanics camps and and the people in the wave mechanics camp. Right, and so so Heisenberg okay. is on okay. record calling yeah. like wave mechanics disgusting, and uh, and 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 Schrödinger not to be outdone is calling Heisenberg's matrix mechanics uh, repulsive or you know like uh, terms of that effect. But <laughs> so uh, what what is yeah. what I find interesting, and I hope we get we get to this yeah. later is that um, the, the these two theories are really quite different, and they have sort of different roots in the earlier history. Mm. And that gets papered over uh, by the fact that, you know, within a year or so, it was shown that these two theories are just mathematically different descriptions of the same, uh, you know, underlying uh, situation. But, but to this day, right. I would argue, you can see that, uh, you know, people think differently about quantum mechanics, whether they are, depending on whether they are sympathetic to the sort of Schrodinger line of thinking, or whether they're sympathetic mm -hmm. to the Heisenberg mm -hmm. uh, Bohr line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so from a, from your perspective, Michelle, so what 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 would you think is uh, more simple and more elegant if if they are ultimately describing the um, same process? Okay, uh, that that's a, that's an interesting. So, so <laughs> uh, I would say without hesitation, matrix mechanics. Uh, but that goes very much against yeah. the grain of like you know what is accepted physics. So um, uh, if you if you look at if you look at how the theory uh, was disseminated and in particular like how it was turned into textbook physics, it was like a, a slam dunk mm. victory for wave mechanics, uh, and people were very and, and oh, I think okay. that's just partly because the physics community in the mid twenties was very accustomed. To using the kind of mathematical mm. techniques uh, that uh, uh, that 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 you need in in wave mechanics, people were very you know uh, uh, proficient in like dealing with like wave equations. Mm. The kind of mathematics that you mm. need to do matrix mechanics, like we now call linear algebra, uh, was far less familiar. I mean, mm. like Heisenberg himself did not when he when he first published his paper and is basically looking at uh, you know like uh, matrices. He did not recognize that he, he he had like well there's this strange thing that there are these objects that are central to my theory that have two indices one indicating an initial state one a yeah. final state and if I have two of these objects a and column a and b they do not commute a times b is not the same as b times a now that's of course a standard property mm. of matrices but it had to be pointed out to him by uh, Max Born with whom he then uh, wrote like a uh, like a, a another paper. Uh, that that was indeed like you know a, ve a very well known like mathematical object. So th so these so these techniques were uh, were were, um, uh, were were unfamiliar to physicists. And you know a another thing that illustrates that is that you know it took like a mathematician like von Neumann to uh, you know to to tell to instruct physicists like okay you know uh, this wave mechanics is just one particular way of doing business here. 
but you can uh, you can also do business like the way that the matrix mechanics people are uh, are doing. And so the reason I, I I say like I prefer matrix mechanics is that um, it's a, it's sort of a more austere picture of the uh, of the situation. Like if you if you go for wave mechanics, it's very easy for all kinds of like imagery coming from waves to slip in. So actually, this is nice because this is precisely why I don't like to start uh, with like the double slit experiment, right? Because, um, right, so if you have to, <laughs> so the way I think about, yeah. uh, uh, you know, in quantum mechanics, the double slit experiment is like, okay, the statistics that you get if you do like uh, measurements are going to depend on like, you know, what you do to the system, whether you send it to one uh, slit or to two slits. And, uh, and so that's just, you right. know, the, the, the hard experimental facts. And if you then like start like, uh, em embellishing that story about like, well, you know, you should think of this electron as like a wave that goes through like both of these uh, these slits. Well, you're you're introducing some imagery that may actually be quite misleading, right? So for starters, uh, these waves are not waves yeah. in ordinary space, right? I mean, that works if you have one particle, mm. but if you have two particles, they're already waves like in six dimensional space. So it's it's in they're waves in configuration space. And like as Born like pointed out right. to uh, to Schro and Schrodinger initially thought these are like very physical waves, right? But by so Schrodinger is presenting these ideas in uh, early 26, and by the end of 26, Max Born has already convinced him, like, no, 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 these are at the end of the day, there are these 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 are waves in these higher dimensional spaces, and they have like a probabilistic uh, interpretation. So are there some experiments uh, going on in parallel? These okay, are all yeah. sort of theoretical. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm mostly interested in, in the history of theoretical physics, uh, but it's a good question. I'm glad yeah, you yeah. asked this because, like, yes, there are incredibly important uh, uh, experimental developments. So remember, I, I started, say, started with, but like, it's all about black body radiation. It was, it was because of precision yeah. measurement of these curves for black body radiation in the late 1890s, but, but people now completely forgotten, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, uh, Luma, Pringsheim, Rubens, uh, Kuhlbaum. I mean, uh, they, they, uh, if they had yeah. not done these precision measurements, like a, a, a law that was uh, derived before Planck by uh, Bean would have done just fine. Right. It was that people were really trying to do this very precisely that Planck realized that law, that Bean law is wrong and I need to come up with something else. So that's one. Mm. Uh, one of my colleagues mm. in history of um, history of physics, like Alan Franklin, who is a specialist on the history of, of experimental physics, right? He wrote a book, The Neglect of Experiment, yeah. uh, uh, calling out precisely <laughs> the yeah. bias that you're pointing to, that historians of physics, myself included, mm. tend to look at theory rather than experiment. And in the global experiment, let me just like this is a good anecdote. That, so yeah. he, he's, he's using like, you know, yeah. like uh, Shakespeare and Stoppard and saying like, you know, the announcement that uh, to a group of physicists that Loomer and Pringsheim are dead is like, you know, like people in Hamlet being told that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Like, who cares? <laughs> but at this juncture, though, the, the theory is getting accepted. It's sort of the mechanics of how it works. That is that is um, being debated, right? So yeah. So is, but is, is, so, is so, but let me. So, like, yeah. uh, the, uh, I'll keep it short. But there's a lot more to be said about the experimental side of yeah. things. So uh, it, it really mean it. Yeah. So it, um, uh, if you look at uh, you know the period from 1913 to 1923, I mean there's so much uh, information mm. that they didn't have about spectroscopy that becomes available. Mm. And in a way, it's lucky that early on the, 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 the data are very imprecise because that means that you can get away with murder, essentially, like theoretically. But by the, by the early <laughs> 20s, like the experimentalists have nailed down so many of these parameters and like some of these spectra are so well known that they really are a great testing ground for like these models. And, that, and that's when it becomes clear that these symptoms now, in hindsight, very simplistic models of sort of miniature solar systems are just never going to work, and that drastic steps are required, right. either to to abandon this whole idea of orbits, that's what, what uh, uh, Heisenberg and co. do in matrix mechanics, or to just give up the idea that we're talking about particles and thinking like really it's sort of a wave phenomenon, which is the path that Schrodinger then takes. Mm -hmm. So yes, these, these experimental developments are extremely important, without those, 
nobody would have seriously considered like uh, you know adopting a theory that is as weird as quantum mechanics hmm. okay so um so so uh, maybe we'll take a quick break michelle and when we come back uh, we'll talk about okay. the 30s and beyond <laughs> okay talk to- This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Um, so we were just talking about Michelle about uh, the, the quantum mechanics, the development, the people involved uh, from 1900 to 1930 or so. Uh, mm-hmm. So by then the field is getting reasonably well established, right? Is it the? Uh, I think that the textbook, the principles of quantum mechanics, came out somewhere around that the 1930s. Yeah, that's that's true. So there's 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 like yeah. a. There's there's several books coming out on yeah. uh, basically presenting mostly sort of a wave mechanics, uh, the wave mechanics point of view um, on quantum mechanics. Okay, okay, and so so at that point, how how, how has it progressed from that point on, and who are the who are the major characters? Okay, um, so uh, like in physics itself, what you're seeing is that um, this theory is going to be a is going to be applied to like other fields, right? So it yeah. as I uh, as I uh, was telling you before, like it very much comes out of like atomic physics, mm. but like going into the 30s, they're going to probe deeper and they're going to look at nuclear physics, like you mm. know, looking at the structure of the, of the nucleus and yeah. also at, at um, uh, you know, like collective behavior. So this is like when it's going to be applied to things like solid state physics, right? And leading mm. to important. So nuclear physics, of course, in the end is going to lead to atomic bombs right. and, and, and condensed or like solid state physics now called condensed matter physics. I mean, that's going to like result in something like transistors, right? So there's very important yeah. uh, developments within physics. Um, right. And so quantum mechanics is like unbelievably successful. It's mm. clear that this is, uh, this is not just like a theory atomic physics it's really like a new a whole new way a whole new framework of doing all kinds of physics right and uh, so today the only thing that has not been brought under its purview is gravity Mm. Uh, and everything else is governed by the basic principles of of quantum mechanics and so i like personally i like an analogy uh, from computer scientists where they're saying like look uh, quantum mechanics is just a new operating system and like all these different uh, applications, atomic physics, molecular physics, condensed matter physics, they're all different applications, like you mm. know, written for that same operating system. It's a complex. It's a complex operating system. A very so, complex. So, oper- so, though, I mean, yeah. it, 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 though, uh, yes and no. Yeah. So, uh, if you follow like the historical development, like you know, it's unbelievably hairy and complicated. But what is surprising to me, so as a professional historian of, 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 of physics, what I find surprising is like the it's unbelievably complicated to understand like all the fine points of the spectroscopy that got us to quantum mechanics. But once you have the theory and once you you present it like in a in a simple form, like von Neumann did, it becomes unbelievably simple. And so uh, if you now like are interested in uh, uh, in in applications in say in quantum information, yeah. uh, you don't have to worry at all about like these uh, all these uh, complexities, and you basically get by with learning just a smidgen of linear algebra, and you're off to the race. Yeah, it has high predictability and hence um, you know plethora of uh, real applications coming out of it. But I often hear Michelle that. Um, you know, at the heart of it, it still have difficulties. We, we can't really, really describe in, you know, in, in highly intuitive fashion <laughs> how it works, right? Yeah. No, this is, you hit yeah. upon like, you know, the big problem, of course. So, yeah. so in like, it, on the one hand, it's clear that this is tremendously successful in, uh, in terms of like uh, doing physics. Uh, on the other hand, like it's very unclear, like what to make of it. 
and like so all right so we can uh, you know we can calculate like uh, all these uh, we can predict the outcomes of all these experiments but what does this tell us about like the quantum world you know what is this world like mm -hmm. and that is a debate that started as soon as the theory was born like you know like in 25 27 um, yeah. 27 in particular when you have like the fifth Solvay meeting you have the Como conference you have like you know the first clashes between Einstein and Bohr you know like very famous and that debate essentially con continues like unabated mm. to this day, right? So there was like a period <laughs> of decades where, you know, like the mainstream like was uh, was exerting like, you know, like great control over what people were allowed to think about this, right? This was the period that the physicist David Merman has described as shut up and calculate. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, and uh, but then like, you know, in the, I would date it to like, you know, the, uh, like the late, late 80s, early 90s, yeah. Uh, uh, people were dissatisfied, dissatisfied with these answers that were supposedly uh, given by Bohr in these very hard to read uh, 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 papers and very wooly <laughs> formulations and all this. And so now, like, there's sort of a plethora, plethora of, like, different interpretations on the table with yeah. uh, very serious defenders, like, you know, ranging from, like, you know, the, the Everett Many Worlds interpretation, Bohm. So, so before we get yeah. into, yeah, so what was Einstein's problem with it? Well, so how, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so Einstein, of course Einstein's most famous one-liner on uh, uh, on uh, uh, on quantum mechanics is "God does not play dice." <laughs> and yeah. uh, so I don't I don't think I mean the the uh, the statistical nature of the theory I don't think this is what what bothered Einstein like uh, most about it. So mm -hmm. uh, the thing that the thing that bothered so there's a few things that bothered him, right? Yeah. But one of the, one of the things is like um, uh, you know like that uh, uh, something that, that that for which Schrodinger like introduced the name entanglement. Yeah. That um, you know, like in quantum mechanics, th things have this tendency to get sort of entwined with one another, uh, so that you have like a, a a compound system consisting of two components, and you can no longer describe like assign like a separate states to these mm. two components. Like you know, you can only des describe a state to the uh, to the compound. And Einstein thought, well, you know, if you can't do that, you know, you, you, we can't do physics as we know it anymore because we're always talking about, well, what you do, what are you doing to this particular system over here? And that should be independent of what you're doing to like a system like over there. And what we <laughs> seem to have in quantum mechanics, as he put it, once put it, is that we seem to have sort of spooky action at a distance that when I do something over here, that immediately starts to affect something over there. Right? So this is like if you if you have two particles, let's say two electrons or something. Yeah. And if they're entangled, then if we observe uh, electron one, mm -hmm. uh, then you, ex uh, some property of electron one, let's say spin or something like yeah. that, then you automatically know uh, what what is the property of uh, the second particle, right? Regardless of the distance. Correct between them yeah and it's very counterintuitive because we were all taught that information cannot travel mm -hmm. more than the speed of light and so conceptually you can separate uh these two particles to you know to to the both sides of the universe so to speak uh, but they will immediately have that type of an info it's not necessarily information exchange but that's a paradox yeah right? no so yeah. um and 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 um so but yeah, what's weird about it is that uh, so so yeah, you measure uh, you measure the spin of one particle, like so you have like yeah. an entangled pair of particles, uh, where entangled just means like you know like it's it's described by a state that doesn't sort of factorize in the state of one particle, state of another particle. Now you let these particles separate. You measure the spin in one direction of one particle, or like the the polarization of a photon in, on on one photon, and the spin in another direction on the other particle or the, the, the polarization, and these things are very strongly correlated, right? And, yeah. and, uh, and um, so, but what, you, what quantum mechanics also shows is that those correlations can never, ever be used to send signals, right? So right. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the foundations literature, it's now like you always have the same characters. It's always Alice and Bob, you know, performing yeah. these, these yeah. measurements. And so, you know, the, so the first step is to realize, oh, you know, uh, uh, when, whenever Alice like finds up, uh, Bob finds uh, down and vice versa. Yeah. That's very strange. And then the next uh, thing, the next uh, statement is, 
But Alice and Bob cannot use that strange behavior to send each other like send each other like instant messages. Right. Right. And so, um, so you know, there's, so there's different ways to think about this, um, and this is like what uh, you know what the debate, uh, like in the end, uh, like you know, uh, is it has been about for the yeah. for, for decades now, right? Right. And, and so, so people came up with so so. Let me understand that, Michelle. So, um, if Alice is down, Bob is up, mm-hmm. and vice versa, and. Um, and, and that is uh, regardless of the separation between them. Correct. Uh, but we say you cannot use that for information exchange. Mm-hmm. And, and why is that? Um, well, I mean, like you, if you look, if you look more carefully at the, at the mathematics of these correlations, yeah, <clears throat> uh, you see that uh, you know, like what? So what, what? What would you have to like? Imagine what it would be like to 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 uh, try to exploit this. For communication purposes, yeah. Right? So um, you um, um, you know, it's like you know, in the end, it's like fifty-fifty if you do a measurement of spin in in a certain direction, whether it's going to be up or down. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these correlations, like also like uh, persist. If you, you also have these correlations, if you measure spin in one direction, Alice measures spin in one direction, and Bob measures the spin in in some other direction. Okay, mm-hmm. and um, so. Um, so now, like, imagine that they that they make a they make a plan together and say, okay, you know, um, you're going to send me the answer to a simple yes no question, and yeah. if it's going to be yes, you're going to measure spin in the x direction. If it's no, you're going to measure spin in the z direction. Right. And then I, you do that, Bob, and then I, Alice, I'm going to always measure spin in the x direction, but I'm going to the the I'm going to see in my statistics what you're doing on the other side. Right. And if you then look carefully at what quantum mechanics predicts, is that what Alice is going to see up or down, it's 50-50, regardless of whether uh, Bob is measuring a spin in the X direction or spin in the Z direction. So for the statistics, it doesn't matter at all. The story you're going to tell is, is different, uh, mm. depending on whether you uh, wh- whether Bob does one measurement or the other measurement. But you know, for the it, at the end of the day, for what you're, the statistics that you're obtaining in this experiment, it doesn't make a darn bit of difference. And so, one way to look upon this is to is to uh, and this is the the, the the viewpoint that I I've come to favor, yeah. uh, which is related to this uh, uh, to you know what is what is often called the Copenhagen interpretation. Mm. It's like well, you know, one of the things we've learned is that, uh, you know, you you can have like these uh, these distant correlations that are non-signaling because like the moment that you can send signals, you run afoul of problems with special relativity, right? So you you want hmm. you only want to want to allow uh, 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 correlations in 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 the world that are non-signaling, and it turns hmm. out that that class of correlation is bigger than we thought. We thought. That you know any kind of distant correlation, like you know, like uh, is basically explained by uh, the the correlated particles already having the relevant properties the moment they separate, right? Right. And it turns out, and this was like uh, the big result of John Bell, like in the early '60s, um, like you, it's simply impossible to uh, uh, to do that. And so, and 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 those proofs have been have now been simplified to the point. That you can explain to a uh, to a general audience quite simply. So David Merman has done this. I I, I like a book by uh, Tanya and Jeff Boop called Totally Random, like a, a a comic book about quantum mechanics, where they have very simple examples showing uh, how this how this works. That you just simply that you get these distant correlations, but you cannot explain those by assuming that everything has already sort of been determined in advance. Yeah, so one thing that uh, made sort of intuitive sense to me, uh, correct me if, if, if there's a right way to think about it. So, so suppose I have a pair of gloves, a left and the right hand gloves, mm-hmm. and I keep the left one in one box and keep the right one in another box, seal them, and I send those two boxes uh, to both sides of the, uh, different sides of correct. the universe, right? Um, when I open box number one, I will always find the left glove. Yes. Uh, and granted, I, you know, somebody on the other side of the universe is going to find the right glove. Yeah. But it doesn't really. Yeah, that uh, would that yeah. would not surprise anybody, right? I mean, so if, if <laughs> yeah. only the world were like that. But now, so now the situation is that quantum mechanics says, like you know, before you open the box, 
uh, it's uh, the, it, the 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 glove is not left or right. It's only decided the moment you open the box whether right. that glove in that box is left or right, and then uh, uh, it is immediately decided that the other that the glove in the other box has to be the opposite. That okay. is it, right? And so this is something that Einstein also found. And so Einstein had like he had like a uh, uh, so there's a very famous paper that he that he wrote together with uh, uh, two colleagues Podolsky and Rosen called the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper in 1935, uh, yes. which is by now uh, by by orders of magnitude Einstein's most cited paper. At the mm. time, it was seen like oh you know the old man has lost touch with physics <laughs> and all this. Um, yeah. Einstein like had a simpler argument like the, a year earlier where he says okay you know suppose like you know you have two cups. And uh, uh, quantum mechanics tells you that it's it's fifty fifty which of those two cups have a ball uh, under it. Okay. Uh, now yeah. you lift one of those cups and you see, okay, the uh, the uh, the ball is not under it. So that tells you immediately, well, the ball is under the other cup. Yeah. Now we ask, like, well, before I lifted the cup, was mm -hmm. it decided that the ball was under the other one? Right. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's like intuitively, you would say, of course, of course. But quantum mechanics says no. Like quantum mechanics only gives you this probability. And then Einstein says, "Well, that's too bad for quantum mechanics. Then it's incomplete because, of course, like it was known <laughs> ahead of time, right?" And so <laughs> and this, then you know, so so he 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 pushed that argument further, like in this EPR paper. And then, yeah. like you know, like decades later, like you know, with people like simplifying that argument, David Bohm, like replacing. The uh, observable science I was talking about by spin components, and then John Bell in the early '60s showing, like, you know, uh, this idea of Einstein that I can just add like further description to the quantum mm. system, something called hidden variables, is just not going to work unless you know these hidden variables themselves, you know, have like very strange properties that they mm. allow you know th uh, things to travel like faster than light, right? Which, which right. sort of seems to defeat uh, the uh, the purpose. But I mean, this is again like I should I should not say defeat the purpose. Uh, this idea of like having what are called non-local hidden variables, such as mm. in uh, uh, in the in the the Broglie Bohm pilot wave theory, there's plenty of people, especially in philosophy of quantum mechanics, that are quite fond of that way of thinking. And there's I also know like a physicist who uh, uh, who who uh, like that way of thinking, even though it's it's sort of you know like intention. It's not in contradiction, but intention uh, with uh, with uh, with relativity. Okay, so so what is the Copenhagen interpretation? That is a very good question. Yeah. Um, uh, so this is like totally unclear. So a, <clears throat> um, so it's it's the the what is typically called sort of the Copenhagen interpretation, or I would call the the mainstream, the textbook interpretation. It's sort of an amalgam. Of the thinking of Bohr and Heisenberg, with a little bit of Dirac, a little bit of von Neumann, like mixed in. Um, mm. Heisenberg like introduced this term at some point, like way after the fact. This was a conference that the, people got together. No, so the reason it's called the Copenhagen yeah. interpretation is just that uh, it's it's mostly associated with Bohr, and Bohr uh, had this big institute in Copenhagen. That's why it's called oh, okay. the Copenhagen. And yeah. so, and and Bohr, uh, uh, you know, like he was kind of a father figure. And a, and, and, a, and a guru, a mentor to a lot of these, like, uh, you know, young whippersnappers who, uh, who put quantum mechanics on the map, you know, the one that I, ones that I talked about before, Heisenberg, Pauli, et cetera. Yeah. So um, now, um, so the, um, uh, uh, so, so the, the, what? The interpretation, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so the, 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 the standard way of, uh, uh, of, of thinking about the Copenhagen interpretation is that, uh, well, you know, we're going to need, when you do a measurement, uh, we're talking about sort of the interaction of a quantum system with like a classical system. And, the, yeah. and, that cla and, then, and what, when you do this measurement, the wave function is going to collapse. That's sort of a very sort of crude uh, <laughs> uh, sort of physics 101 version of, uh, of, the, uh, of the story. If you look more carefully, you see that well, yeah. you know that that crude view was not held by anybody, um, but you know, like there are, like you know, uh, there there is this idea that uh, uh, you know when you do a measurement, then you know one of the possibilities of uh, uh, that quantum mechanics view is realized, and the others disappear, and that is like again like in intention with like uh, the way things normally evolve in quantum mechanics, uh, which is uh, where, you know, you don't have these kind of collapse. So this leads then to something called the measurement problem where quantum mm -hmm. mechanics in it on this standard account seems to give you one story 
for you know like when uh, uh, things develop left to themselves, and another story for when like you know we we as humans like perform like a measurement, right? And so people have have, have felt like okay, this is just an unacceptable state of affairs. And like I have suggested, like other uh, ways of uh, of uh, of of making sense of quantum mechanics, such as Bohm or Everett, right? So the Everett interpretation. So, yeah, yeah. So before we, yeah. So let me just uh, understand yeah. this a little bit better. So um, before we measure, yeah. there is a probability distribution, yeah. and at measurement, that that probability distribution essentially collapses. And so let, let me know if, I, if I'm thinking yeah. this correctly. So let's say I lost my bag in Manhattan mm -hmm. and I say I want to find it um, and I haven't looked anywhere. So before I look, there is certain probability distribution. The bag could be mm -hmm. found anywhere. And I go look in Penn Station. And at that point, it's a zero or one. Either I find yeah. the bag or yeah. I don't find the bag, right? The probability distribution basically yeah. collapses at that point. Is that well, I mean, like, but if you if you put it yeah. that way, right? I mean, there it's yeah. there now. It sounds like, well, what else is prob probability distribution supposed to do? You know, like uh, there's nothing physically collapsing. It's just like you know, you've now discovered like one of these one of these possibilities is actually correct. OK, now in quantum right. mechanics, it's a little more it's 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 trickier than that because you're not yeah. discovering. Right. You, to get back to your example of the of the two uh, gloves, you're not discovering yeah. like, OK, here is the, the the left glove is sitting in this box and therefore the right one in the other box that I've sent to the other side of the universe. No, no, no. Quantum mechanics does not allow you to say whether that glove was left or right. Right. So in a way, by doing right. this measurement, you are like, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, like the language becomes like very strained at this point you are sort of creating if you wish like reality you are forcing you know the uh, uh, the 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 the, 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 yeah. the glove to make up its mind like either it's going to be like left-handed or right-handed and this is like you know why people are are are, are complaining about like you know you shouldn't be thinking <laughs> about this collapsing of the uh, uh, of a probability distribution in this, in the terms of like you finding your uh, your lost bag at uh, at Central Station. Now, uh, I personally think that uh, this idea that it is not that different from from finding the bag at the Central Station, and that it, what we really discovered is that nature is just has some intrinsic randomness. Like you know, at the end of the day, we cannot uh, we cannot predict uh, with with certainty. Even if we factor in everything we know. There is going to be an intrinsic random randomness. Like at the end of the day, the world is the ultimate crapshoot. Okay, uh, but yeah. so that you know, but you know, uh, uh, people f find that like uh, uh, sort of an unappetizing thing to swallow, and this is true for all of these things. So you, you're a Bohmian, you're you're a Bohmian. Well, then you have to swallow that uh, you know, like you have an uneasy relationship with relativity theory. You're an Everettian, many worlds interpretation. Well, then you have to swallow. That uh, well, there's a gazillion copies uh, of you, like in all these other worlds that you will never have access to, right? So it's one of my yeah. So the yeah, so the Everettian interpretation. So uh, again, going back to the glove example. Yeah. Um, so the interpretation there is: I open the box, I find a left yeah. glove. There is an identical universe. Uh, where there is a right yeah. glove. So everything else in that universe is exactly Correct. the same, yeah. except the box has yeah. a right glove, right? And so both of those, both of yeah. those happen yeah. simultaneously. So, to, yeah. so I used to be an Everettian. Uh, and so, yeah. um, uh, again, what you're sketching now is sort of the very crude version of, of Everett. Yeah. Uh, in a way, like, it's, it's a little more subtle than that, I think. So basically, yeah. right, so... Um, the problem here is to explain, like, how is it that these observables, like, uh, at some point acquire, like, definite value? So in this case, you have a glove. How is it, does it happen that it becomes a left glove or a right glove? Okay. And so, well, you know, on the Copenhagen interpretation, that, well, it's just a crapshoot at the end of the day. You do a measurement, you ask, you, you ask nature a question, and then, like, it makes up its mind, and it's going to be left or right. That's the end of it. Now, on the Everett interpretation, yeah. there's never a collapse. There's never a collapse. All that happens mm. is that, uh, you know, you get tight correlations. So you get, you now, quantum mechanics like itself is now going to predict, right, that 
the moment you open the box, that you enter enter into a superposition, right? In one, you know, in, in one part of the superposition says the glove is a left glove, and you believe that you that it's a left glove. And another part of the of the superposition is that the glove is a right glove. And you believe that it's a right glove. That this is all like this may sound strange, but this is a straightforward prediction of like you know the quantum um, uh, of, of quantum mechanics. If you believe, which most people do, that quantum mechanics applies to everything, and there is no realm where you have like classical measuring apparatus or anything. Quantum mechanics is the theory of everything. So this this now happens. So now you uh, now you say, but oh wait a second, um, but I never. I never am in such a superposition, right? I'm never, I'm never uh, confused about like whether I'm seeing like a left glove or a right glove. And quantum mechanics again right. like predicts that you know like no, you're always going to be sure <laughs> that you're seeing like a particular thing. So what's going to happen now is that like another uh, aspect of, of quantum, something called decoherence, is going to ensure yeah. that these two branch, these two terms in the superposition are going to feel like different uh, branches in a multiverse, right? And so that the way yeah. to think about this now is that out of this quantum description emerges like one world in yeah. which uh, a person very much like you is uh, is definitely seeing a uh, left glove and in another world also like you know a person also very much like you will see like a with the opposite uh, value i forget what i just said left or right and that's, uh, so so, okay, so this so is like so i personally pref when i was you know still like an everedian i sort of prefer to mm. to to paint this picture not of like uh, sort of a many worlds, but like sort of a one world where everything is perpetually in limbo and which you can then stink <laughs> off, right, as, uh, uh, as you know, like different terms in this quantum superposition that all like, you know, form like, you know, their own worlds and then quantum mechanics guarantees that none of these worlds will ever know about the existence of any other ones, right? But that's that's right. a steep price yeah, so, to pay. Do yeah. you really believe that that's the case? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, uh, so Everidians have asked me, like, uh, Everidians have, like, true believers have told me, like, whenever I now like narrowly escape disaster, I don't feel so good because I know that there is many other universes in which, like, it didn't, the outcome <laughs> didn't go so well, right? So there's now many universes in right. which, like, you know, I'm living, we, the two of us are living in a universe where it looks as if, like, Biden will, like, you know, like, eke out a win, but there's, like, other universes just like that where, you know, like, Trump <laughs> will, like... Uh, uh, will, like don't, 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 don't are, remind if me. If you're a true believer in Everett, <laughs> you're going to have to, you, I mean, a good many branches in the multiverse, you know, like, there are people right. just like us who are going to live with Donald Trump for four more years as president, you know, that's the reality of it. <laughs> yeah, so that's yeah, that's a, that's an important distinction. So um, the the superposition is not just for that observation, but it is for anything that is connected to that observation. So in the in the case of the glow, it's not just the glow, but the the observer has to believe. Yes, it's a left yes. glove, right? And, um, and, and the observer has to be there uh, to, to believe that. So all the macro systems around that is also Correct. a superposition. But, it's, but this, right? this is all so like, you know, the, like yeah. you, you're rapidly now going down what I would call the rabbit hole of, uh, of the Everett interpretation, <laughs> yeah. which is very popular among physicists. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned, like, so I, uh, uh, you know, like a, a few years ago, um, I sort of fell off the wagon um, and by reading another book by the guy I mentioned, Jeff Boop, a book called Banana World, uh, uh, Quantum Mechanics for Primates, yeah. in which he is like right. uh, pushing something that now goes by the name of an information theoretic interpretation, which, as he argues, is really sort of a, a more a more reasonable gloss on Everett, right? I mean, all these different interpretations, like, I mean, there are sort of crude versions of it. You know, the crude version of Everett would be like anytime you do anything, like the world splits into a myriad copies. And I hope to have given you a bit of a sense that that's not fair to the Everettians. Their, their story is a good deal more sophisticated than that. Also, Copenhagen is a lot more sophisticated than, oh, we posit that there are like you know, measure big measuring apparatus that is governed by uh, uh, by classical physics. No, no, everything is 
is quantum. But you, but at the end of the day, like you know, you are uh, you know performing like a um, uh, uh, you you are performing experiments, and like these experiments like have like uh, like random outcomes. And what's worse, what's worse, and this to me from this information theoretic perspective is really sort of the weird thing about uh, uh, and the new thing about quantum mechanics is that um, you know you if you um, uh, if you now want to know. Uh, two different properties of uh, uh, of like a system. Uh, you cannot, you cannot yeah. like typically, you cannot uh, uh, find that out at the same time. So suppose with, to stick with your glove example, that you you don't you not you not only want to find out whether they're like you know like right-handed or left-handed, but whether they're black or brown. All right. So classically, you think, oh, this is no problem. You know, I can check whether it's left or right, and I can check whether they're black or brown. But in quantum mechanics, that uh, you're not, you can't do this. Like you know, these are these properties are represented by by mathematical gadgets that prevent you from doing yeah. that. So you 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 end up with a with a with uh you know your picture of the world is going to depend heavily on what you decide to do. If you decide to to mm. look at okay, is this left-handed or right-handed? You um, uh, you cannot at the same time like have a picture in which like you know it's it's like black or white, and all these pictures just don't add up to one overall uh, uh, overall big picture. So this goes by the by the uh, right. by the uh, you know the technical term of like they like you don't have like a uh, like an like an overarching Boolean algebra where Boolean algebra is just like a fancy way of saying you you assign like yes no yes. You, you you assign true false values to every statement you care about. So if you if you want if you care about the yeah. statement, is the glove is black? Yes or no? Right? You cannot in the same world like assign a value yes no to the glove is like right handed left handed. Right? Now this is like a very yeah. unusual and hard to hard to get used to property. But so people in this camp. Right to which I now uh, account, in which I now count myself, I'm saying, okay, that's what we've learned. Like you know, apparent, it, it turns out to be possible to have experience of a world like that, and what we then see, like all the other guys are doing, are you know, like desperately cling to this idea that no, there has to be like one overarching thing that in which it all makes sense, be it a multiverse or be it like non-local hidden variables, right? That's the bold or the effort way. And we're saying, we're saying we're, yeah. the, the way that we're reading Bohr is Bohr saying, that's the sort of stuff that you have to have to give up, you know, let that go and then <laughs> just accept what you've, uh, what you've discovered here about, uh, about uh, quantum mechanics. And so you, you mentioned at the beginning of this book, that uh, that I wrote, like you know, like quantum, yeah. understanding quantum raffles. That's precisely the sort of view that we are arguing for, you know, like uh, and basically take the attitude, like, look, you know, the things like the measurement problem. At the end of the day, like we don't see this as problems. We just see this as sort of features of reality <clears throat> that we've discovered, and that you know, you just you just need to accept, right? And this is very close to what you know the leaders of this Copenhagen movement, like. You know the, the the mainstream like the Pauli, Heisenberg, and Bohr were saying. Right, right. So, so are you saying that Michelle that the paradox arises from um, really sort of counterintuitive? You know, we didn't have quantum mechanics uh -huh. for most of human history. Uh, you know, we didn't uh, you know go go out to kill uh, and eat. <laughs> for, you know, we, we didn't really have thought experiments about quantum mechanics. And we very recently found this. Uh, and so our brains are not really, uh, really designed for this yeah. concept. And so every time we think about this, we are going back and testing, um, you know, based on our sort of natural understanding. And it's all coming yeah. to no, I mean, it. Like, uh, so this is like, uh, I yeah, mean, this yeah. sort of goes back to something I, I, I said about like the history of the subject. I mean, uh, if it weren't for like these unbelievably uh, puzzling experimental facts, in particular in spectroscopy that came to light, you know, like in around 1920 or so, we would never have gotten to a theory this weird, you know. Yeah. But now we, <laughs> now we do, yeah. and we know yeah. like from uh, using it now for a century in physics, this theory works, you know, where classical theory really didn't. Mm. And so now like the question is like, okay, you know, how do you how do you make sense of this? And like so, there's like various options on the table, 
And no matter what option you go for, like, you know, a colleague of mine in Minnesota calls it the conservation of misery. Um, that no matter what option you're going to go for, you're going to have to swallow something that is kind of difficult to swallow, you know. So uh, do you really right. believe that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we're living in a multiverse? Do you really believe that, you know, maybe special relativity is wrong? And uh, so, yeah, this, this, is where, this is where we're, uh, we're at and everybody. And I don't think uh, a part of it is, is that there are just no knockdown arguments, right? I mean, like, it's not as if like, oh, we, we can do this calculation right. and now we can show, like, this position is inconsistent. At the end of the day, it's like plausibility. And it may not be, it yeah. may not be testable, no, so, right? But that is, there's that, that also, is like, I mean, I yeah. would be remiss if I did not mention this. There's also, like, a, a one, interpre yeah. one interpretation is on the table, which actually changes quantum mechanics. So, the, 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 the interpretation I've talked about so far, Copenhagen, Everett, Bohm, they don't want to change quantum mechanics. Yeah. Bohm wants to add something to it. Bohr and Everett want to add, try to yeah. add nothing to it. Like, you know, they smuggle some, some, uh, some things yeah. in, but they try. But there's another uh, approach called the GRW approach called for uh, Girardi, Remeni, and Weber. They yeah. want to change like one of the central yeah. equations of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, and have like a little stochastic terms yeah. where uh, that, uh, that work out in such a way that if you go to large enough systems, say cats that they will collapse so that yeah. you don't have the embarrassment of like cats that are in a superposition of being dead and alive okay or gloves <laughs> okay. that are in a superposition yeah. of being yeah. left and right or black and brown so but this is really changing um a small change in quantum mechanics and so in principle such a theory might be testable you know as, as long as it's not testable it's right. just, I would say, it falls in with all these other theories. Like, well, okay, you know, if it makes you feel better to like add this uh, uh, this uh, little uh, wheel to the uh, uh, to the operation, fine. But you know, these people could claim like, no, 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 we're just we're not adding like another epicycle to the system. We are like changing the theory in ways that you know maybe we can predict. It's not going to be you know totally random. We're going to come up with some other like sort of statistical regularity that hinges on the details of how we add this stochastic like collapse um, uh, uh, mechanism. Right. So, so, yeah. So, so in conclusion, then Michelle, give me give me sort of your interpretation of it or okay. <laughs> your preference. Yeah. So, so I've already sort of indicated what my uh, yeah. what my preference is, right? And so yeah. Um, now. And I, I think the best, you know, like, uh, you know, if, if you give me a chance, you know, you're basically giving me a chance to put in a plug for my point of view, right? And so yes. rather than reiterating what my point of view is, I, I would say this. So what, what I see as the, the strongest argument for, you know, the, the kind of view I'm pushing, and this is like what a lot of our book is about. It turns out that the central formalism of, of quantum mechanics, the Hilbert space formalism that was introduced by von Neumann, is the exact same formalism that is used in sophisticated modern treatments of statistics and probability theory, okay? And so what that <clears throat> seems to tell me is that Hilbert space is, uh, is not something about like, you know, the furniture of the world. The world is not made out of wave functions, as Sean Carroll says in, new, in his new book. No, Hilbert space is like a formalism to deal with probabilities, right? And uh, and so if you, if you, if from that point of view, I think you can sort of work out like a consistent way of thinking about quantum mechanics that sort of avoids like these big problems, the measurement problem in particular, uh, right, uh, where you have to swallow some other things like, you know, there is no overall Boolean description. No, we cannot completely write the observer out of the story, right? These are like, you know, big concessions to make. But to me... Like given the, the this close parallel between general probability theory uh, in uh, uh, and like the Hilbert space formalism of quantum mechanics, that seems to be the most promising uh, uh, avenue to me to uh, uh, to come to to you know to have an interpretation. Great, this is exciting. Uh, it, you know, it, uh, the thought experiments one could do here. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I mean, the other thing I should really I say is imagine. that these are not thought experiments <laughs> yeah. anymore, right? I mean, yeah. uh, so ever since the uh, the late yeah. 60s and early 70s, 
uh, you know, these 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 uh, uh, experiments that for Einstein were thought experiments have been done. You know, like uh, uh, so there are these all these experimental yeah. tests of the Bell inequalities. They're ongoing, and again and again they find that quantum mechanics is correct. And so yes, the spooky action at the distance that Einstein was talking about that has been. <laughs> Proven, yeah. right? And you can, and the the, the other the, the other thing right. I'll mention is that no matter how you think about this, no matter how you think about this, I mean, since it's there, you can start thinking about what can we do with it, right? And so now you have like quantum computing, quantum <laughs> cryptography, and even though the, the, the debate about how right. to make sense of this like rages on, uh, you know, that's not going to stop like you know computer right. quantum computer engineers from trying to come up with like physical systems that could actually realize you know, some of the computational power that would come with exploiting these, uh, these, new, uh, these new options. Excellent, yeah. Excellent, yeah. This, this has been great, Michelle. My pleasure. Thanks so Thanks much for, for having spending me. time with me. And uh, right. <laughs> thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.